looking at. Before I, before I start it, um, let's talk about the cast of characters here. There's Elisha, not Elijah, but his, his uh, protege, Elisha is, or some people call him Elisha, so they can hear the difference. Um, he is in there, his, his buddy Gehazi is in there, and then you have who the writer of Kings calls the Shunammite. It's all they, there's no name, there's no nothing. So what we're going to do, because there's the Shunammite and her husband and her son, so it's gonna be Mr. and Mrs. Shunammite and boy, okay, that's the way we're gonna do it. There's no other names, we're just gonna have some fun with this, and, uh, and we'll go with that. Uh, I am going to read, it's a long passage of scripture, I'm going to read a small section in the beginning, and then I'm going to read the rest of it later on at the third point, and then we will go from there. So that's how, that's how this is gonna fly. So let me read the first section, and then I will pray and I will first put my glasses on so I can see. And that helps. So it's Second Kings chapter 4. I'm going to start with verses 8 through 10, I believe. Yes. And, uh, and then we will pray. One day, Elisha went to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. I like this woman already. So whenever he passed by, he would turn in there to eat food. And she said to her husband, behold now, I know that this is a holy man of God who is continually passing our way. Let us make a small room on a roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp so that whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. We're going to stop here. We're going to pray. So, Father, thank you, Lord, first of all, for your word. Thank you for stories. Thank you for colorful characters in Scripture that we can enjoy and learn from. We ask, Lord, that you will bring insight into this passage and that you'll help us to understand really what it is to seek you all the more. So we thank you, Father, for this time. Help me to communicate. You know my limitations. In Jesus' name, amen. I've entitled this passage, Seek God All the More. Uh, it's gone through many titles, but that's the one I ended up with. The main point for this passage, this message, is when you're not sure what to do, run after God and pray. Short and sweet. When you're not sure what to do, run after God and pray. So we, uh, there's a, three things we're going to look at in this passage. I'm going to read these uh, pretty well. And this, is, this isn't just a Mother's Day passage. Uh, it's good for moms, I think, but it's good for everybody. We'll all get something out of this. My three points are walking with God equals a life with God. Point two a couple with outlandish ideas, along with kindness, can bring about God's purpose. And then finally, all is well, even when it isn't. Don't slacken your pace. Okay? So that's where we're going. So point number one, walking with God equals a life with God. We, we talk about walking with the Lord. I mean, that's it, depending on what church you, you go to. If you go to an old church, the first church I ever had was out in the middle of nowhere in southern Ohio, and, and people would come up to you and say, how long have you been walking with the Lord? You know, and they, they'd ask you questions like that was your age or something like that. So walking with the Lord, the Bible refers to walking, to walk blameless, to walk in the truth, to walk by the Spirit, to walk in love. The Greek for walking defines it this way, to con how you conduct yourself how you make one's way to regulate one's life. When we're walking with God in mind, it affects who we are. Plain and simple. If we're walking with God, it affects who we are. It does have an impact on our conduct. We look at things in light of who God is, not who we are, not who 
everything else is, but in who God is. If we have a biblical walking with God, we see a perspective that the world doesn't see. It's just a different perspective. It's a different way of looking at life if we're walking with God. It's different from the world, and it's motivated by love. If we go by Bauer's past messages, it is motivated by love, and we act accordingly. In our passage, we have the story of the Shunammite woman, Mrs. Shunammite. And she really, as we look at what happens, we can see that she walks with God in mind. That is her thing. She walks with God in mind. It affects what she does. It's how she looks at things. It says that she was a wealthy woman in the English Standard Version. It says she was a prominent woman in the New American Standard Version. But both versions will have down at the bottom of their Bible, they say, we really don't know what this word means. I have a suggestion as to what this word means. And I am no Hebrew scholar by any sense of the imagination. But I think it, it's, it is an adjective. There's, there's nothing. It's a descriptive word. It's describing who the woman was. And I would say that it's describing her personality as much as anything else. I think that's what it's doing. The word can be translated in the Hebrew as great or large or intense or loud or important. Now, if you mix all those together, you may have a very interesting human being right there. I think she's an outgoing and expressive person with a large personality. I think that's what it's saying here. And that's OK. I think that's the way she was. It's funny, in relationships, in a, in a marriage relationship, you have couples, and they're totally the opposite. Somebody is very expressive and boisterous in their personality, and the other person is very quiet and calming. It can go both ways. Sometimes it's the husband, sometimes it's the wife, sometimes it's the kids. But anyway, the husband can be larger than life as well. They can stand out in the crowd. But sometimes they're both the same. Sometimes their personalities are both larger than life. The important thing is, what does walking with God look like to them? Because it can be different by who you are, who you, what your personality is. What does God, walking with God, look like to you in your life? It's not going to look like Mrs. Shunammite. It's going to look like you. And that's the way you need to look at it. I think we can learn some things here from Mr. and Mrs. Shunammite as we look more closely as they are walking with God, keeping close to God, keeping God in mind. There's a looking for opportunities, I think, as we walk with God. She saw the opportunity to show kindness to Elisha. What do you look for when you try to show or extend kindness to someone? What are you looking for? Sometimes I see it as an inconvenience. <laughs> you know, that's sometimes the way it is. But what do you look for when you're trying to show kindness to someone? Now, I'm not sure what she said exactly to him, but it seems that she was pretty determined to do something for him. As he walked by their house on a regular basis, he would just continually walk by their house, traveling to wherever he was traveling. When your neighbors walk by your house, what do you do? If you're, do you walk, uh, you know, every morning, every morning there's a person that walks by our house and they're walking Sparky the dog or whatever his name is. And what do I do? What do you do when someone's walking by your house very often? Do you talk to them? Do you greet them? Do you say anything? Do you start a conversation? Do you try to get to know them at all? Is it an opportunity? I would suggest to you that as a Christian, when we're walking with God, we try to reach out to other people in some way, 
in your personality, not as Mrs. Shunamite. But it's sort of an automatic response, and I think we can grow in that. Maybe you're not larger than life like Mrs. Shunamite, but you start to see the need. You start to see a response. You start to see yourself doing something. Now, you also have Mr. Shunamite here, and how does he respond? Now, she has invited him to dinner, and she's feeding him and stuff like that. How does Mr. Shunamite respond to this? I think his personality is totally different than Mrs. Shunamite. He is totally, she's an extrovert, and he's an introvert. That's, I think, the way their relationship is. I think that's the way it goes. But she says to, to Elisha, come, you know, you're walking by. I want to urge you to come and eat. It says she urges him to come and eat. Sounds like my grandmother. She's urging him to come to eat. Eat, eat. What's the matter? Don't you like it? You know, that kind of thing. The word urged here means persuaded upon. Prevailed is what it means. She prevailed. And it says, you know, he would go in and eat. She was, after all, large in personality, okay? Why was she so determined? I think it's because she walked with God. She discerned a need. She wanted to act on her faith. She wanted to show kindness. And that brings about something that brings us to the second point. The second point is a couple with outlandish ideas along with kindness can bring about God's purpose. A couple with outlandish ideas or a person, doesn't have to be a couple, a person with outlandish ideas along with kindness can bring about God's purpose. Not only does she feed Elisha and his buddy Gehazi, but she says to her husband, hey, we should make a room for them. We should build on an addition on our house, is basically what she's saying here. But not only that, let's furnish it. Let's put a bed in it and a table and chairs. Let's go to Ikea. We'll get a lamp. We'll do all of these things. Just for him, no charge. It's the first free B&B &B that ever existed. And I love the fact that Mrs. Shunamite suggested making a place for him. But the next verse, you see, it's already built. What does that say about Mr. Shunamite? Mr. Shunamite jumped on the bandwagon. He says, great idea. There you go. He built it. How often do you listen to the ideas of your spouse and then you kind of squash them? How often do you do that? Whether it's your wife, whether it's the husband, when they come up with an idea, whether it's your kids, they come up with this great idea and you squash them. Sometimes the idea, now, let, let, me, let me just say this. Sometimes the ideas are not that good, okay? We'll, we will say that. Sometimes they aren't. However, too often they get squashed before they're even considered Sometimes because the spouse doesn't care. They're not interested. It's too much trouble. They just don't want to do it. Doesn't want to hear it. I've done that. For example, let's, let's take Abby as an example. Okay, Abby's the one that plays viola on the stage. Almost 20 years ago, Abby comes up and says, I want to take music lessons. And I went, no. Yeah, I'll take a music lesson. I want to listen to that squeaky sounding noise all the time. I don't want to hear that. And we just kind of, I squashed it. Godly Abby, meek and mild, came up and she said, would you please consider and pray whether I can take music lessons or not? And I was immediately convicted. And so Roxanne and I prayed together and, and now we have what we have because I no longer squashed it, you see. It happens. It happens. I've done it. But we see the potential. That's what the thing is. We have to start to look with eyes of faith, looking at the potential and getting God's perspective on it. And then you decide whether you should do it or not. You should look clearly at it 
with patience, listening, considering, and praying, realizing that your spouse or your kids may have something that God wants you to do. We shouldn't just assume anything. We should consider. You see, when you're walking with God, opportunities come. Ideas come to mind. And some may even seem extremely outlandish. What's the most outlandish thing? Think about it. Just think to yourself, what's the most outlandish thing you've done in the name of the Lord? Think about that. With the sense that it was God leading you to do it. And you might say, boy, I haven't done anything outlandish. Maybe it's time to consider that. For example, 20 years ago, if we want to go back 20 years again, this is the year of our 20th anniversary, so I keep thinking of 20 years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, when we moved out here, a number of families moved out here to help start this church. And when we moved out here, uh, I had a job but no place to live. I worked for FedEx. Can you say that? Can I say that? I worked for FedEx, and um, I didn't have a place to live, and someone in the McLernan family said, hey, you guys can move in with us. Now, the McLernans were just moving in as well. In fact, Mike was traveling on a trip. Trish was just getting everybody ready to move into their brand new house that was just built. And three days later, we moved in, and we moved in before even Mike got there. <laughs> so we had their four kids, our three kids, us all in the house, and Mike comes home and goes, yay! You know. <laughs> But Mike was all for it. But it was an outlandish idea. It was an outlandish idea. What was the fruit, though? A friendship for 20 years. Helping start a church that's been going for 20 years. The blessing of watching your kids grow up. Helping each other along the way as we've gone. Those are precious things, and it all came out of an outlandish idea. It's good stuff. See, all things should be prayed about and considered. Why? Because God, at times, does outlandish things. And don't we want to do what God's doing? We need a heart for being used by God, walking with God. Now, I know every marriage is different. There's no cookie-cutter marriage that you... There's the, that marital dynamic that always plays a part. But I think the Shunammite woman, if for an example, I think she was a Proverbs 31 sort of person. I mean, the excellent wife. If you ever read Proverbs 31, she had a heart for her husband, uh, she rose early. She provided food. She dresses, she dresses herself with strength. She had strong arms, it says. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. She's generous. She's not afraid of snow. That alone should cause you to want to marry the woman. She's not afraid of snow. She's called blessed, and her husband praises her. And there's more. There's more in that chapter. She had a wealth of vision. She had a wealth of personality. Her husband saw that. And she includes her husband in what she does. She doesn't just go off on her own and do her own thing, but she isn't afraid to bring things up to him. This is another interesting aspect of the husband and wife dynamic. People usually say, well, you haven't talked to my wife. You haven't seen my husband. And they go back and forth. They're not like that. They're not able to do that. Well, let me tell you something. Most people, when they marry someone, they have no idea who they are to begin with. You don't know who you're marrying 20 years later, who you end up with. I mean, that's, that's just a, a fact. We have these, when we, when we, and I'm not trying to tell you you can't get married, but I'm just saying, let's go in with our eyes open. That prophetic word was for married people. Let's go in with our eyes open. 
you are not going to know what your spouse is going to be like in 20 years. That's just the way it is. We're not supposed to be, and they're supposed to be different. It's an adventure. When you get married, you're saying, God wants us to be together, and we want to serve and live for him for the glory of God, and we start an adventure that never ends until death do us part. Mr. Shunammite, he was an older man. He was a man of means. He was a property owner, a farmer. Uh, he was a manager. He had people that worked for him. But you know one thing that he was that I think is extremely important for us to know? He was a wife truster. He trusted his wife. He didn't have a problem with her doing things and being active. He knew that she'd come to him because he married the Proverbs 31 woman. I encourage you to read Proverbs 31. The main thing that they had in common is they both had a heart to serve God. The best thing they had in common was that they had a heart to serve God. You know, our wives are not meant to be like us. And we are not meant to be like our wives. It wasn't meant to be that way. When, when God made Adam and Eve, he made Adam, and then he said, okay, I'm going to make Eve, but I'm not, I didn't have a cookie cutter to go in the mud and make another one, I made someone totally different. And that's what our wives are. It's an adventure. It's supposed to be. I like Matthew Henry's commentary, or in his commentary of the quote of husband and wife. It says, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to top him, or out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be loved. The important thing here is that Mr. and Mrs. Shunammite were a couple, and they were a couple of faith. They were called to be a couple of faith, people of faith. And this doesn't apply to just married couples. It applies to everybody. We're called to be people of faith. The Shunammite family hungered for God. That's what you need to do. You're going to hunger for God. We need this in life because life brings all kinds of, apart from adventure, turmoil into our life. And we need to be prepared for it, which brings me to point number three. All is well even when it isn't. Don't slacken your pace. All is well even when it isn't. Don't slacken your pace your pace. I'm going to read verses 11 through, hmm, I might stop at 17, but we'll, otherwise we'll keep going. We'll see what happens when I get there. Uh, starting at verse 11, one day he, Elisha, came there and he turned into the chamber and he rested there. He, he went to his B&B &B and he said to Gehazi, his servant, call this Shunammite when he had called her, she stood before him, and he said to him, that this is kind of an interesting dynamic here, their communication. Elisha didn't usually speak to her directly. He spoke to her through Gehazi. I don't understand that. I don't, I'm not sure why, but that's the way it was. He said to him, say to, now to her, see, you have taken all this trouble for us. What is to be done for you? Would you have a word spoken on your behalf to the king or to the commander of the army? And she answered, I dwell among my own people, which means I'm very content with what I have. I'm content with where I am. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, well, she has no son and her husband is old. And he said, call her back, basically. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway and he said, at this season, about this time next year, you shall embrace a son. And she said, no, my Lord. O man of God, do not lie to your servant. But the woman conceived, and she bore a son. About that time, the following spring, as Elijah had said to her. We're going to keep going. When the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers. And he said to his father, Oh, my head, my head. And the father's, 
said to his servant, carry him to his mother. And we had lift him up and brought him to his mother. The child sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. And she went up and laid him on the bed and the man of God, bed of the man of God, and shut the door behind him and went out. Then she called to her husband and said, send me one of your servants and one of the donkeys that I may quickly go to the man of God and come back again. And he said, why will you go to him today? It's neither the new moon or the Sabbath. And she said, all is well. Then she saddled the donkey and she said to her servant, urge the animal on. Do not slacken the pace for me unless I tell you. So she set out and came to the man of God at Mount Carmel. When the man of God saw her coming, he said to Gehazi, his servant, look, there's the Shunammite. Run at once to meet her and say to her, is all well with you? Is it well with your husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered, all is well. And when she came to the mountain, to the man of God, she caught hold of his feet. And Gehazi came to push her away. But the man of God said, leave her alone, for she is bitter in distress. And the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me. Then she said, did I ask my Lord for a son? Did I not say, do not deceive me? And he said to Gehazi, tie up your garments, take up my staff in your hand and go. If you meet anyone, do not greet him. And if anyone greets you, do not reply. And, he, and lay my staff on the face of the child. Then the mother of the child said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So he arose and followed her. She had a personality larger than life. Gehazi went on ahead and laid the staff on the face of the child, but there was no sound or sign of life. Therefore, he returned to meet him and told him, the child has not awakened. Then Elijah came into the house. He saw the child lying dead on his bed. So he went in and he shut the door behind the two of them. This is what he did. He prayed to the Lord. Then he went up and he laid on the child, putting his mouth on his mouth and his eyes on his eyes and his hands on his hands. And as he stretched himself upon him, the flesh of the child became warm. Then he got up again and he walked once back and forth in the house and went up and stretched himself upon the child. And the child sneezed seven times. I have no idea what the significance of that is. And the child opened his eyes. Then he summoned Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her. And when she came into him, she said, pick up your son. And she came and fell at his feet, bowing to the ground. Then she picked up her son and went out. What an amazing story this is. There's one more lesson I want you to see in this section. Uh, There's probably more than that, but that's okay. And this is it. All is well, even when it isn't. Don't slacken your pace. There are a number of examples here for us to look at regarding this. We look at the harvest. You know, we, we talk about the harvest as in, in the church. We talk about evangelistically the harvest, the, white, the fields are white and ready for harvest. Pray for workers for the harvest. The harvest is a very important thing in the church. Well, the harvest at that time was an extremely important thing. It was the food that you would survive on. So many have said that the father, oh, he's just being a typical dad. Oh, go bring the kid to his mother. And that wasn't the case at all. That's why she said all is well to him because she knows he can't stop working. He has to, so to speak, make hay while the sun shines. He has to keep going. He cannot slacken his pace. They need to get the food in. So he sends the boy, by way of one of the workers, to the mom, Mrs. Shunamite. And she loved her son and she cared for him. She sat him on her lap. She didn't know what to do. And he died. So she calls to her husband, one of the workers. She says, give me a worker and a donkey so I can go quickly to the man of God. 
and come back again, she says. And he asks why. It's not the full moon of the Sabbath. You can tell he's thinking here. You can tell he's going, hey, wait a minute, there's something going on. But he's wondering about it. But she knows it's the harvest, and he has to keep going, so she says, all is well. So the husband trusts her. He sends the worky, worker, he sends it worky, he sends the worky and the donkey. He sends the worker and the donkey to go to the man of God. And they, they it says they urge the animal. It isn't, isn't, that's what she urged Elijah to come and eat. Now she's urging the animal, don't slacken the pace until I tell you. And she comes to Mount Carmel where Elijah is. And she says to Gehazi, because Elijah sent him ahead, he, she says, all is well. With her husband, with her, the boy. She says, all is well. She doesn't want to stop and explain. She doesn't want to say, okay, Gehazi, let's sit down. Let me tell you what happened. No, all is well. I got to see the guy. I got to see the man of God. She's grief stricken. She wants to tell Elisha what happened. So Gehazi takes his staff, like according to what Elisha, Elisha says, and lays it on the face of the boy. He was to go and not greet anyone. Gehazi was. He was to go and not greet anyone. If anyone greeted him, he was not to reply to anyone. He was not to slacken his pace. Nobody's to slacken their pace in this story. It's to keep going. We have to keep going. We don't give up. We just keep going to what we're supposed to do. And she expresses the urgency to have Elisha go with her to the boy. She says, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. She didn't slacken her pace in urging him. She urged him to eat. She urged him to come. She's going to continue to do that. So Elisha just gets up and, and goes with her. And Elisha arrives at the room, the room that he stays in, and the boy is lying on the bed that he used to sleep on. And he didn't just stop and look at the boy and turn to the Shunammite woman and say, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. What he does is he shuts the door on Gehazi and Mrs. Shunammite. And he immediately goes to prayer. That's what he does. He immediately goes to prayer. And then he lays down on the boy. He does it two times. He doesn't give up. And the boy sneezes seven times. Don't slacken your pace. Keep going. Now, this is what I want you to see. When things are going poorly, when life is falling apart, when grievous things are happening, don't give up. I cannot guarantee the results of what's going to happen, but don't give up. Don't slacken your pace. If you're facing a major family issue, you need help with that. Run to God. Pray to the one who can do something about it. That's what he did. If you are facing a major directional decision in your life, you need help with that. Run to God. Pray to the one that can do something about it. If you're facing major health problems, you need help with that. Run to God. Pray to the one that can do something about it. Don't slacken your pace. When it comes to prayer, don't slacken your your pace. When it comes to serving God in the church, don't slacken your pace. When it comes to your devotional life, don't slacken your pace. When it comes to trying to understand your spouse, don't slacken your pace. When God has called you to do something, don't slacken your pace. When it comes to loving your mom on Mother's Day, do not and I repeat, do not slacken your pace. And you can do that for the rest of the year, too. You know, I hope you got my point on that. <laughs> you know, we're going to be entering a season soon when this pandemic is going to slow down. 
It'll be behind us. It'll be a relief. You know what the biggest temptation is going to be? That we're going to start to sit back and relax. We're going to let go of the momentum that we have had during the pandemic, the momentum that we had of prayer, the momentum we've had of trust, the momentum of faith that we have grown in, the vision we've had to reaching out to people. We may forget what we are called to do. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance without slacking the pace, the race that is set before us. You know, when you're running, I don't run anymore barely walk nowadays, but when we're running, when you're running, you're trying to get a stride. You're trying to get an even stride and you keep going. That's what we're looking for. That's what keeping the pace looks like. Laying aside every weight, what's, what's the hindrance? Is it sin? Lay it aside. What's holding you back? If there is a particular sin, repent and ask God for forgiveness. Run to God. If it's unforgiveness that you're struggling with, forgive. God will help you with that. Is it money? Is it status? Is it comfort? Is it laziness? Fill in the blank. Go to God. Lay these things before him. And let's run the race. Let's keep the pace. Let's seek God all the more. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for this story. Lord, we are, we are always grateful when something turns out with a happy ending. The child lives, and we're grateful for that. Lord, there are so many times when we are faced with the fact that, that it's not as clear what the ending is. Sometimes it's not as sad. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you, you watched over this woman as a lesson in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that in two chapters later, you sent your prophet to speak to her and say, you must leave this area for seven years. It's going to be a famine. And seven years later, she comes back. And what do you do? You give the favor of the king to her because of all she did for Elisha. Lord, the kindnesses that we show are investments in your kingdom. We don't know what the fruit will be out of that. But anytime we invest in you, Lord, we do see fruit. We pray, Lord, that you will envision us. We pray, Lord, that you will quicken our step. We pray, Lord, that you will give us the faith to run the race that you set before us. So we thank you, Lord, for your care and your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dave.